Hey, everybody. My name's Rich Falco from Train by Techs and CarQuest Technical Institute. And I got a video for you today, short little video, something we've talked about before, um, but I feel like it it's worthy of repeating, um, going after battery draws. I was called out to a shop, very good shop, very knowledgeable shop, coming to my classes for at least five years now, and we were chasing a battery draw issue on a 1997 Jaguar XK8. And it wasn't that difficult of a problem. We figured it out rather quickly, and you're going to see all that. Um, but, you know, the, the techs that have been coming to my classes have been listening to me talking about these techniques for five years. And it really surprised me how much they struggled with battery draw. So uh, while fixing this one, we... Uh, we were intent on using their tools and me walking them through their testing, and, and you'll see we struggled with a little bit of that. But uh, for those of you who are pretty good with voltage drop and voltage drop across the fuses, this is a good review. For those of you who struggle with battery draw, hopefully we go in depth enough that you understand why we're doing what we're doing. So let's uh let's jump into this uh there's a couple of different videos there's a, a couple of different examples here and uh hopefully you like it if you got any questions uh, send us some messages find us on facebook uh, check out our website and so on and so forth so first things first uh we got a 1997 jaguar xk8 the uh, This is the customer's second or third car. It's not their daily driver. The battery goes dead, but it goes dead very quickly. Uh, the customer bought a battery maintainer, and even with a battery maintainer on, the car still goes dead. So the I show up. They pull the car into the shop for me. And um, I'm, I'm saying that for a reason. Bear with me here. Uh, but uh, they bring the car in for me. And the first thing we need to do is set the car up, which means open all the doors, open the hood, open the trunk. I need access to all of the fuse panels in the car. But I need this car to think he's closed up and, and locked up and can go to sleep. So if there are door jam switches, we need to close them. If they're built into the latch, that makes it easy. Most newer cars are. You can just take a screwdriver and, and, and force the door latches and trunk latch and hood latch closed, which is what we did. For newer cars, we want to get the key away from the car because that key, if it's a proximity key, is going to try to talk to the car and keep things awake. Uh, but we want this car to go to sleep, and that may take a while. We may have to, uh, again, on a newer car, it, it can take 45 minutes to an hour, depending on the car. So... So that's what we did. We got this Jaguar in the door. We opened up uh, <laughs> all the doors, the hood, the trunk. We uh, shut the key off, got the key away from the car, let it go to sleep. And that's where we're at when we start this video. First thing I want to say is, uh, <laughs> you know, my goal was for the shop to use their tools and for the techs to walk through this themselves. Um, you'll notice here, let me see if I can pause it in the right spot. There's the customer's 1.5 amp battery maintainer. Now, the shop has a Virus Pro. He has a high amp clamp, a low amp clamp. He's got everything you can imagine. Go get your Virus. We're going to use the low amp clamp. We're going to see what the current draw is. He doesn't have a 9-volt battery. He's never used a low-amp clamp, so uh, we don't have a 9-volt battery. Not a problem. I got some in my Pico kit. I run out to my Pico kit, and I realize, oh, I don't have a spare 9-volt battery because I left my amp clamp on the last time I used it or time before that I used it, um, so I had to use my spare battery. No, no big deal. We'll just use my amp clamp. No, I left that one on too. So this is the struggles of, uh, you know, these these amp clamps. You, you've got to remember to shut them off. And then it comes to me, I have a Pico 4425A. Boy, I hope that's the right model. I have the newest P Pico, uh, which has powered attachments like the low amp clamp and the high amp clamp. And remembering batteries and remembering to shut things off is a thing of the past. 
this isn't mine. It's on loan from from Bryn, who's you know uh, got it on loan from Pico. So we've all kind of been playing musical chairs, passing it around, and trying to uh, um, do some videos with it. There's the attachment, the this this BNC plus or what I honestly I forget what they call it. Shame on me. It powers the low amp clamp. The other thing it does is auto identify the attachment to the Pico. So I've got the Pico hooked up to my laptop and it's auto identified it. It set the scale up for us. We can see that we have a two amp draw on this battery. So the car is shut down. The amp clamp is on the negative cable. We could have went to the positive cable. It doesn't matter. Amperage is the same throughout the circuit, but uh, the negative cable is the easiest one for me to get the low amp clamp around. And I've got a two amp draw. Already we can see why the battery went dead even with a 1.5 amp maintainer on it. It wasn't enough amperage to keep the battery fully charged. And this is a significant draw. So there's a bunch of different ways we can go about this. And to be honest with you, the Pico is overkill. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm using it because we didn't have any 9 volts handy and I wanted to record this real fast. Um, your U-scope and an amp clamp could have done this. My Vantage hooked up in series with the battery could have, could have got this. We only need one channel. Um, but it really is nice. The, the Pico with the, with the automatic setup is, is kind of nice for somebody who doesn't have a Diag cart with you know, everything at his fingertips uh, like maybe some of you do in the shop. But now we know we've got a draw. Well, <clears throat> uh, a lot of guys will say, oh, two amps, walk around the car with a thermal imaging camera. That's absolutely a valid way of going about looking for a draw, especially with something as significant as two amps. Uh, remember, I said somebody else pulled the car in. This is Florida. The second he started that car up and pulled it in, there's enough current flowing through all those fuse blocks that I probably am not going to get a quick and simple direction. If I let it set for a couple hours, maybe an hour, I, I might have got something. But um, I decided to go with voltage drop across the fuses. So we need to find the fuses. Well, it's not often I say something nice about Jaguar, but right next to the battery in the trunk of the car is this panel. Um, <laughs> uh, identifying panel for all of the fuse box. Notices there's like six different fuse boxes on this car, and there's a label for every single one. Uh, this is before Ford got involved with Jaguar, I think, or right around that time. So uh, I guess Ford hadn't completely infected them and got rid of useful labels like this. But in doing voltage drop across the fuses, we're trying to find which fuse is using this current, which fuse is drawing this current. So bust out the multimeter and simply check voltage drop on the millivolt scale across the same fuse. We're not looking for power, we're looking for the drop in voltage across the fuse. So I'm checking that yellow 20 amp fuse there. And when I get my uh, leads across that, you see it drop down to zero. The voltage drops down to, to near zero. There's no voltage drop, there is no current. That is a fuse that is not powered right now. He is not the source of the draw. And then I move to the next one. This is a very quick and simple way of determining which circuit has the draw. So I go through every single fuse in the trunk of this vehicle, and I don't find a single one with any voltage drop whatsoever. So one fuse panel down. Time to go back to that chart. Now, see if I can do this. Uh, I started in the trunk, and I worked my way over to the side of the dash, then under the hood on the left side, then the front of the hood, then I came back to the back, the right corner, and then to, what is that, F? Yeah, it looks like F, on the passenger side of the dash. As I worked my way around, I was checking all the fuses and looking for voltage drop, and there was none. I went all the way around until I got to that fuse panel, F, 
and the absolute last fuse. If I had just started in the other direction, I might have caught it right away. But the absolute last fuse that I had to check is where I found a measured voltage drop. So <clears throat> the first thing you notice when this video starts is, what the heck is that? That's aftermarket stuff. And anytime we're chasing battery draws and we see aftermarket stuff, that, that's a huge red flag. If, if you look, you see the wire tucked down here. We see a little box here. I'm guessing is part of some type of alarm system. It wasn't the draw. It was the first thing I jumped to. I made an assumption and it wasn't the draw. So I check voltage drop of all of these fuses working my way up. All of these fuses working my way down. Remove this. Got all the way to that very last fuse. That guy right there. Let's back up for one second. And let's zoom in. On fuse. Now the way these fuses are displayed is backwards. It's, it's uh, like a mirror image. So dimmer module is the fuse with a measured voltage drop. So let's jump to that video. You see me pointing to it right there. Oh, jump to the next one. I'm trying to use two hands to get across the fuse. And there you see about 14.3, 14.2. I'm right across the fuse there. I have a measured voltage drop. There's current traveling through that fuse. I'm going to let it play a, a second time here. 14.3. I think when we come back down to it, it, it drops to 14.2 or right around there. So 14.2 millivolts of voltage drop across the dimmer fuse. What does that mean? Why do we have voltage drop? Uh, I pre-recorded a little close-up video of me doing this on a test panel in my uh, in my shop. So um, <clears throat> we're gonna we're gonna jump to that. Hopefully that answers some of your questions as to what we are seeing and why we do it this way. Um, but it it is a way of determining the circuit without unplugging fuses, without taking the chance of modules resetting of of uh, relays that are stuck on switching off of other components waking up and skewing our, our values. Uh, but we definitely have an issue here with that one fuse, and we're going to chase that right after this. Okay, so I have a simple little circuit built here. Uh, that allow us to explain voltage drop. When we talk about checking voltage drop across the fuse, I don't think we've ever done a video where we truly explained exactly what is going on. So on my little test board here, I have power in this top corner, I have ground in this top corner, and I have jumper wires going to switch that has a fuse on it. A little tough to see, but I'll zoom in on that in a second. I turn the switch on, it completes the circuit, supplying power to this side of the bulb. On the other side of the bulb, we need ground. This wire is going through my trusty old Vantage and back out to ground. So <laughs> I'm looking at somewhere around 590, close to 600 milliamps of current in order for this uh, uh, to, to power this bulb here. So my fuse right here, has current flowing through it. If I do a voltage drop test, in other words, if I take my multimeter, I set it to millivolts, which it is on right now, and we see that voltage kind of bouncing around, that ghost voltage or whatever you want to call it. If I take these two from my multimeter and go across the bulb, I see 11.7 volts. Okay, a lot of guys see a red and a black wire and they go, well, this goes, this goes to the positive side, this goes to the negative side. No, these two leads can be placed anywhere in the circuit and show me the difference in voltage any place in that circuit. So 
if I take my leads and I put one right here, right at the power supply, and take the other and put it at the other side of this wire right here, I see a voltage drop of about four millivolts. There's a little bit of resistance in this red wire, in this red lead right here. Not a lot, not enough we need to worry about, but that resistance shows up as voltage drop. So when we have a battery draw issue, rather than pulling fuses, rather than taking the chances of resetting a module uh, or waking something up, if we check the voltage drop across the fuse, we can calculate the current flow. So I've got a 15 amp fuse. I am putting my two leads directly across that fuse. And you can see in my multimeter, it's reading 2.8 millivolts. Let's turn the switch off. When I turn the switch off, my voltage drop goes to zero. If I am testing a fuse and the voltage drop across it is zero, there is nothing, no current traveling through that fuse. I'm not powering anything up. That fuse is not part of my problem. Let me turn it back on here for a second. So 2.8. We have a 2.8 millivolt voltage drop. My vantage here is showing it's actually about 600 millivolts. Now, in the typical battery draw issue, we wouldn't have the vantage hooked up. Or maybe we have an amp clamp hooked up. But we wouldn't have this. All we would have is my voltage drop. So how do I know that 2.8 uh, millivolts of voltage drop is a problem? Here's where we go off to the internet. So now we have to find charts for converting that voltage drop into current. CarQuest CTI has put them in their books for years. Uh, the easiest and quickest place that I have found to find them is on the Power Probe website. So here, I search Power Probe. It's powerprobetech.com. -E Click on that. Under Knowledge, there's a technical library. Click on the technical library, and right in the middle is Fuse Voltage Drop Charts. So I click on Fuse Voltage Drop Charts, and it brings up about eight different pages. What we have on this side of the screen is measured voltage drop. Let's zoom in just a little bit. So this is my measured voltage drop across the fuse, and this is the equivalent current traveling through that fuse. So we were not testing a cartridge-style fuse. We were testing a, um, a standard fuse. So let's move down here a little bit. That's a maxi fuse. Um, there's our mini fuse chart. There's our standard fuse. So we had a blue 15 amp fuse, standard fuse. We had 2.8 millivolts. If we scroll over, we see 583 milliamps, a 2.8 millivolt dr measured voltage drop on a 15 amp standard fuse equates to 583 milliamps. That's pretty darn close. What did we have? Uh, 599 or somewhere right around there? We're in the ballpark. Uh, the, the math works out. So <laughs> that's how we want to go about checking these fuses. I'll be honest with you. When I am doing this test, I am not so overly concerned with the exact measurement. What I'm looking for is which one of these fuses is significantly more than everybody else. Because you're going to have some fuses that are drawing a couple amps for memory uh, and, and you know certain things that stay awake. But uh, when we go through the fuses on this Jaguar, we're looking for the one guy that's significantly higher than everybody else. Okay, so we're zoomed in a little bit just so you can see a little bit better detail. Notice the, the voltage kind of 
bouncing around here a little bit. If I touch the leads to each other right on the screen here, slowly drops down to zero. Keep that in mind. If I am doing a voltage drop test and I don't have a good connection, you see the voltage bouncing around there. But once I go across the fuse and the circuit is on, oh, let's make sure I got a good connection. There we go. 2.8, and it just kind of locks right there. 2.7, 2.8. Take it off, voltage bouncing all over the place. Now we're getting an actual measurement. So keep that in mind. You're, you're, you know, obviously some of these fuse panels are really tough to get to, and uh, you know, we're laying underneath the dash, and suddenly we don't have a good connection, and we're wondering why it's bouncing around. Oh, we need to reposition it. And once we get it on, 2.7, 2.8. If I leave it there for a second, so remember that 2.7 millivolts, because we're going to use that value to determine the milliamp traveling through this fuse. And again, turn the switch off. No current, no voltage drop. Okay, so remember, if I back up here for a second, 14.2 millivolts. You, you saw me do the voltage drop test on, on the test board. We're back to the car. We have to figure out where this two amp draw is, or nearly two amp draw, and we're gonna go to those charts. So we go to the Power Probe website. If any of you have taken any of the amp clamp classes uh, that CTI gives, I guarantee you these charts are in the back of your book. Um, so they're out there. Uh, you, you can find them. I, just Power Probes are nice color, quick and easy to find. We scroll down to our standard fuse. And there's page one of our standard fuse. It was a red 10 amp fuse. So we're looking in that, that column right there. Whoop, went off the... Now all we have to do is find our measured voltage drop. Well, this starts at uh, 0.1 and scrolls down all the way to 10 amps. There isn't anything beyond that. Now what? I don't have 14.2. How do I know? Make the math easy on yourself. Half of 14.2 is 7.1. If we go to 7.1 and we look at the value, we can double the value and, and kind of figure out what we've got. So that's what I did. I went to 7.1, dropped down from that red 10 amp fuse, and we have got 922 millivolts. If we double 922 millivolts, we have 1844, something right around there, 1844 milliamps, nearly 2 amps. All of the current that we are seeing through our amp clamp on the battery is traveling through this one single fuse. Now, <clears throat> I'm an old guy. Uh, the tech I was uh, working with and, and kind of showing him the uh, 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 this technique is, is you know he's got some gray hair, some some uh, experience streaks, and when we saw what that fuse was, the dimmer module, he was the first to say it. Oh, just like those uh, Lincolns. Uh, you know, the old Lincolns, the dimmer modules went bad all the time, and, you know, that was, uh, <laughs> that was the problem. Before we jump to, oh, it's got to be the dimmer module, keep in mind that fuse could power multiple circuits. Now, I get lucky in a couple of different ways here on this car. We bring up the wiring diagram. That's our 10 amp fuse. In looking at our 10 amp fuse, we can see who he powers. There's a splice. Oh, now it goes to two different circuits. But if I follow it down, it goes all the way over to the dimmer module. The other wire goes to this dimmer module. Oh, I gotta go this way. This dimmer module. So here I am, I've gotten lucky. This fuse only powers two things. Keep in mind, these are solid wires which means I'm seeing the entire circuit. If it was a dotted line, I might have to look at other wiring diagrams, like this ground up here at the top that I'm circling. Hopefully you can see that. Oh, no, wait. This ground up here that I'm circling. The fact that it's a dotted line lets us know that this wiring diagram isn't giving us the whole picture. There's other things going on there, but these wires are solid, so I'm seeing the whole thing. So... <laughs> 
at this point I'm comfortable pulling that fuse. And when I pull that fuse, the draw goes away. Now I want to make sure of one thing. I want to make sure I don't have a Jaguar doing Jaguar things, which means incorrect wiring diagrams, incorrect colors, uh, things going on that aren't in service information. Just pulling the fuse doesn't tell me any everything. I put the fuse back in, the draw comes back. I decide, well, if I unplug the dimmer module and the draw goes away, then at least I know there's no other mystery modules on that circuit that Jaguar hasn't given us a wiring diagram to. So um, that arrow shows dimmer module adjacent to right-hand fascia, fascia fuse box. It is literally right next to the fuse box where the fuse is. I get really lucky. That's it right there. That, that plug is unplugged. So when I unplug the dimmer module and I go back to the trunk, I don't know if you can see it, but it's at zero. All of the draw is gone. I found my problem. My problem has to do with the dimmer module. Now, if I plug it back in, it goes right back to two amps. Here's the important thing, and, and I know Bryn did a video like this where, you know, they, they thought they had nailed the problem, and I think it was a... I think it was a caravan um, that uh, had really thrown them for a loop and they, they didn't find the entire issue. We need to make sure that this dimmer module is the problem because what if something is telling this dimmer module to do something? What if um, this dimmer module is being kept on by somebody else? Again, we get lucky. The wiring diagram is labeled with inputs and outputs. And it's pretty simple to figure out. I'm going to use my pointer because it's probably easier to follow than my, than my finger. But if we start at the bottom here, the, the first input is a ground. Well, I'm going to assume this ground is good. I'll be honest with you. I didn't go looking for it. I wasn't really worried about the ground. I don't think a bad ground is causing this problem. Uh, but test light multimeter at pin 9 of that connector. Going from power to that wire, the test light lights up. Okay, I got a good ground. Look at the other inputs. There is a yellow wire labeled as an input, a red and yellow wire labeled as an input, and a white and brown wire labeled as inputs. Here's the thing we need to ask ourselves. Is the problem the dimmer module? Is the dimmer module bad? Oh, it's a common failure item. Or is it staying on because something else is telling it to stay on? In looking at the rest of the wiring diagram, we get a little bit more of the picture here. So let's zoom in. Here's my ignition switch. The ignition switch is shown in its at rest position, in the off position. If I turn the switch to accessory or run, you'll notice that a ground travels through the switch and is applied in accessory or run to this pin, which travels down to the dimmer switch. So this dimmer module gets an input from the ignition switch and it is a ground. Look at pin four, this red and yellow wire, and let's follow that one down. He goes to the lighting stalk. If this lighting stalk is turned to side, a ground is provided to this input. Now if we look at yellow and we follow that one down, yellow is a variable resistor in the dimmer override switch. This is an input for how bright they want the dash lights to be. At least that's what I'm assuming at this point. So. What am I concerned with? I'm concerned with, is this red and yellow wire connected to ground, somehow telling this module to turn on? Or is this white and brown wire connected to ground from the ignition switch? Maybe we've got a wire rubbed through. Maybe the guys who hooked up the aftermarket alarm messed something up. So <laughs> with this plug unplugged, take my test light. Actually, I use my multimeter. Um, 
and I checked for a ground on this white and brown wire, and I had a ground on that white and brown wire from the ignition switch. I checked for a ground on the yellow, red and yellow wire. I did not. So I decided to turn the lighting stock on, and when I turned it to side, I got a ground on that red and yellow wire. When I turned it off, no ground. Um, <coughs> yellow I didn't really worry about because the fact that I had a ground on pin 3, this white and brown wire, with the key out of the car told me there's the circuit I need to investigate. This dimmer module might not be bad. That ground might be providing an input keeping the dimmer module on. So at this point, I grab the key. I'm sitting on the passenger side of the dash. I reach over, put the key in the ignition, and literally as I'm putting the key in the ignition, I, I want to kick myself. Remember at the very beginning, I said somebody else brought the car in. I can tell by the feel of the key in the ignition, there's a problem. And I turn the key probably 45 degrees before I feel anything happen. If I had driven the car in, I would have felt that the ignition switch was shot, and I would have known where to go with my testing right away. But they brought the car in for me, and I didn't catch it. But keep in mind, I am maybe 10 or 15 minutes into my diagnosis, and I know where the problem is. Uh, <clears throat> this car needs an ignition switch. Now, 1997 Jaguar, I'm not getting involved in. Uh, <laughs> we diagnosed the problem, and that is all that they, they wanted. And uh, it went from there. I don't know if they called the locksmith or went to the dealer, but uh, the, the car needed a whole lock, lock cylinder assembly um, or switch assembly. I'm not even sure if they're available separately. But uh, I do know he got another switch, and, and the draw is gone. So I hope that the little demonstration, the little walk around this car... Um, explained that voltage drop across the fuse a little bit better. A, a lot of guys see that in class and go, oh, that's, that's awesome, that's brilliant, I can't wait to do that. And then it's three months later before they get a battery draw issue, and they're standing there going, what the heck was Rich talking about with the fuse? Ah, I'm just going to get the test light and start yanking fuses. Um, so, um, you know, for the guys who are, who are new to this, I hope that helped. Um, for the guys who have done it before, I hope this was a good review. But remember, once we have found the fuse, we've just found the source of the draw. We, at that point, we need to figure out what circuit it powers. Uh, and when we find that module or relay or whatever it may be that's causing the problem, we need to take that next step and ask ourselves, is this the fault or is somebody keeping him on causing this fault or th this draw? Uh, I think that's it. Hope you like it. Um, yeah, send us a message if you got any questions. And um, that's it. Thanks Thanks for watching. And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get a couple more of these done. I have another quick, simple one to share with you. Um, and you'll, you'll see that one soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.